Oh, Ryan Grimm. Let's oh, yes, that. yes. Um, Ryan Grimm's uh, new book is out yesterday. Um, the title of which, I don't have it right in front of me. It's his follow-up to, yeah, it's, I think it's called The Squad. Yep. But it's um, his follow-up to the, his previous book, which was We've Got People, which is great. And, and there's there's yeah. an excerpt uh, out today uh, talking about how, which um, I hadn't gotten to yet, that uh, AOC, in her, uh, over the course of her campaign, uh, or I think after she won the primary, I think it was, uh, and was becoming such a big hit, she was offered $100,000 from APAC to start the conversation uh, about how we could support her in the future, and uh, they rejected that, uh, that funding. Um, and that's just one excerpt. It's a great uh, uh, history, it's, it, and, and it gives you, I think, a better understanding of, uh, of the dynamics that are taking place now and that are going to take place uh, in the coming uh, years. Um, Ryan Grimm was on uh, CNN last night. They were talking about an interview he did with um, Ted Cruz, who was unabashed in, in saying, I'm not going to condemn anything Israel does, uh, regardless of all the uh, horrendous statements uh, various have made. In fact, Ted Cruz wouldn't condemn things that even the Israeli government condemned by uh, these speakers. But here is, I think, even the more relevant part is... Um, Grim on there uh, giving some uh, pushback to um, so Aaron, when we were talking about this yesterday. Yes, Aaron Burnett. I mean, clearly at CNN, they're trying to push this controversy, um, this clip that uh, where Dana Bash questioned Pramila Jayapal about sexual violence and claims of sexual violence against uh, Israeli women by Hamas. Uh, and Jayapal condemned it in the clip, and yet Bash persisted a few times in that interview to say, "Well, well, why won't you condemn this?" Essentially, which is a it was a it was an effort to smear her um, and other members of the squad for their continued clear, advocacy for Palestinian rights. And let's also be clear that there have been claims made by Palestinians that they had been sexually abused or raped in Israeli prisons, which gets no coverage. But, you know, we talked about this yesterday. The, I think like the smearing of them is a second order thing. The idea is let's talk about this. Yeah. S second to order. And, and again, I want to remind you the, the, by second order, I mean the question of whether feminists are, um, you know, advocating or protesting uh, in regard of Israel, that is a second order question. Um, the first order question is there was a uh, an attack and um, Hamas certainly committed war crimes uh, in their assault. There is an argument uh, technically that uh, because they're uh, occupied by Israelis under international law, but I think, you know, uh, in terms of... You can of still just, commit war crimes. Yeah. Okay, so there's... Uh, there uh, uh, They committed war crimes in that instance. Uh, and the other first order uh, question is, what are the war crimes that Israel are committing now? Instead, we move it to this sort of meta conversation. And uh, here's Ryan Grimm And a backwards-looking conversation. Look back in the rearview mirror. Don't look to the side or the front where the war crimes are happening right now. Congresswoman Pramila Jayapal, mm -hmm. who is the chair of the Progressive Caucus, put out a statement. And it says in part, quote, let me be completely clear again that I unequivocally condemn Hamas's use of rape and sexual violence as an act of war. This is horrific and across the world we must stand with our sisters, families and survivors of rape and sexual assault everywhere to condemn this violence and hold perpetrators accountable. Now, um, Ryan, the reason that she's making this statement, as you know, is because she faced criticism uh, for these remarks on Sunday, and it harkens back to October 7th, to Dana Bash. I've condemned what Hamas has done. I've condemned Specifically all of women. the actions. Absolutely, the, the rape, the, of course. But I think we have to remember that 
Israel is a democracy. That is why they are a strong ally of ours. And if they do not comply with international humanitarian law, they are bringing themselves to a place that makes it much more difficult strategically for them yeah. to be able to build the kinds of allies to keep public opinion yeah. with them. And frankly, uh, morally, I think we cannot say that one war crime deserves another. That is not what international humanitarian with, with, law says. Okay, with, with respect, I was just asking about the the women and you turned it back to Israel. I'm asking you about Hamas, in fact. I already answered your question, Dana. I, I said it's horrific, and okay. I think that rape is horrific, sexual assault is horrific. I think that it happens in war situations. Terrorist organizations like Hamas obviously are using these as tools. Mm -hmm. However, I think we have to be balanced about bringing in the outrages against Palestinians. Yeah. So then subsequent to that, she had come under a lot of criticism. She's now put out that statement. And and I'm just wondering, Ryan, that statement that she's now put out may indicate she's under quite a bit of pressure. And it may put her at odds with the most progressive members of her party, which is a crucial part of your book about the squad, where you say 2024 well, could be let a Let me do just say, there's another way of phrasing what she just said. <laughs> and that is, it gives us an indication that the pressure that we have actually actively uh, asserted in trying to change the discourse from what is actually happening now to make this whatever you want to call it conflict assault uh ethnic cleansing near genocide upon the uh, uh the palestinians living in gaza we're going to turn it into an interesting battle between six or seven members of congress and the uh, chair of the Progressive Caucus. Like, I mean, the it's idea... It's so insane. Um, and, and this is, you know, be aware that this is what's going on here. Continue. There's quite a bit of pressure, and it may put her at odds with the most progressive members of her party, which is a crucial part of your book about the squad, where you say 2024 could be a do-or-die moment for their political futures. And, you know, when you talk about the squad and Jamal Bowman and AOC, uh, Rashida Tlaib, Cori Bush, why is this such a crucial moment? Well, I think this will be one of the key moments that we look back on, you know, year, years from now and say, remember when... Representative Pramila Jayapal, the chair of the Congressional Progressive Caucus, was made to put out multiple statements reaffirming the fact that she condemns sexual violence. I think that will be a window into how, how warped this has gotten. Just like I said, it's de December 5th, we're talking about October 7th, and what has happened between October 7th and December 5th is, I think, what history is, is really going to remember from this time. And, and we'll look at moments like this as ways that it was rationalized and, and allowed to continue. So I don't, I don't actually think she's gonna uh, face any criticism from the squad for this. There's nobody in the squad, you know, or, or any, I hope anywhere in the world, you know, who wouldn't also just unequivocally condemn sexual violence uh, by anybody at, at any time. Uh, but you do think at this, that this moment, this is a turning point for the squad itself. For sure. So you, you've seen, as I write about in 2022, uh, APAC and Democratic Majority for Israel spent nearly, you know, between 40 and 50 million dollars kind of purging critics of Israel uh, from the party, <coughs> trying to kind of minimize the size of the squad and also get uh, squad like members kind of moderate their position on Israel and Palestine. Uh, Democratic Majority for Israel was founded January 2019 in, in direct response to Ilhan Omar and Rashida Tlaib and the rest of the squad kind of being sworn into Congress. Not, not in response to anything they necessarily said, just the, the mere fact that they were going to be kind of two Muslim women uh, serving in Congress. Now AIPAC is saying that they might spend up to $100 million in this, in this next cycle. And so I know wow. you had Summer Lee on, on CNN uh, earlier. To, uh, so we're gonna, this, this is the, the question is being called and whether, you know, whether, you know, which direction uh, they, they take will be determined, I think, uh, by this kind of cla upcoming clash with APAC. Uh um, good job, Ryan. Good job, Ryan, on your final appearance on CNN. <laughs> yes. Uh, <laughs> at least in this era. Um, she, like, the uh, it was he, he was very artful in 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 making sure that this was placed in proper context because it is absurd, it is beyond absurd that um, one needs to provide multiple condemnations 
for uh, whatever sexual violence uh, has occurred, um, whether it be in the Hamas attack or whether it be in Israeli prisons, uh, whether it be um, in uh, the, the West Bank, regardless. Um, the idea that that, the, that is the primary focus of conversation is a concerted effort by those who would defend Israel's actions now um, to change the conversation. That's basically what it is, and put uh, critics of Israeli action on the defensive. Yeah, and reinforce, I would say, racist tropes about uh, Palestinians and Arabs as being savages who don't respect women as Israeli bombs rain down on women, something like 60 to 70 percent of the civilian deaths that are now up to 16,000 are women yeah. and children. So, like, it reminds me of the um, the coverage of our war on terror, is particularly as it relates to Afghanistan, and that we were going there with our tanks and our bombs to liberate the women of Afghanistan. We cared so much about women. That's why we got to bomb and kill these people, just yeah. like Israel just cares so much about sexual violence against women, and that's justification for their crimes. Like, it works just, it's a distraction, and then also a dehumanization tactic. And it's often the same, uh, similar cast of characters. David Frum is attacking Heidi Matthews, who's a, a law professor who's focused on sex, uh, like issues of sexual violence in war scenarios, and she's just tweet something that I think is just objectively truthful is she tweets is wartime sexual violence a horrific crime yes uh, with no mistake but sexual ex exceptionalism is also traditionally used to whip up support for entire military campaigns we see Israel and the US doing this now to justify uh, prolonged disproportionate air and ground war and none other than David from quote tweeted that uh, or tweeted that but it omitted any, everything after the uh, um, yes, but I'm um, trying to make a point. And if David Frum is taking a keen interest in something, I think it's probably because he's uh, gen uh, rationalizing people dying somewhere. Yeah. And also one more point on this. Uh, how like how disconnected do you have to be from, I think, just like standard uh, temperature taking of, of politics to think that this would cause a schism between Pramila Jayapal and the squad. Oh, well, I, well, I they're don't... trying to, she's trying to will it into existence. Sure. But like, how can you be that you don't even need to agree with the squad on this to understand that this would, there would be no chance that this would cause any kind of issue. But, but I, I think that misses the point of the exercise. The exercise isn't to, um, to assume that that's going to happen. The exercise isn't to even promote that happening as much as it is to simply raise a titillating question and have that question debated and addressed and whatnot. Fill time. And exactly. To simply avoid, it is all filibuster. And, and like any filibuster, it's largely irrelevant unless, like, you know, you're just you're putting out a narrative that gets intriguing so that people can ask that question. That is a good question. Will it? I, I, I guess well, time will tell. I guess I just it would have, be intriguing. I have I, I, perhaps it's that's a moment of naivete that I had to think that like one of the primary anchors that probably makes millions of dollars a year believes somewhat of what she's saying. Nope. Oh, no, that is uh, that is, in fact, that's what the money's for. Is, I, uh, I, I that's, you know, yeah, there it is. Yep. <laughs> and that philosophy was being piped to earth. <laughs> 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 But good for Ryan Grimm. That was a uh, really great. great way yeah, to so satisfying. And he has such a calm tone. Yeah. It just does it so easily. Oh, uh, too bad. Uh, that's his last time on there. Yeah. It's nice to see the guy. I don't know if I would be going with the winds or not, but uh, nevertheless. <laughs> <laughs> um. Jonathan Armstead, uh, rest in peace to Norman Lear. Well, what he did uh, with what he did for sitcoms like All in the Family and the Jeffersons, um, good times. I would add to that. I mean, there are so many. Uh, Maud, um, isn't he the main sitcom guy? Yeah, he right? was the main sitcom guy of the '70s. But but what he did with sitcoms was he his sitcoms were political. They were really political at that time. I mean, you know, for 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 comedies and for t television. I mean, it wasn't, you know, I'm not talking full on satire, but they were pretty political. Um, 
And then uh, starting People for the American Way and Right Wing Watch, that guy lived what could have been two lives. Uh, oh my God, no, I got that already. Fizzy drinks. Sick burn, Sam. Thanks. I'm not sure what that was referenced to. Uh, oh, how about Viva Swampy? Says live free and uh, die. Uh, L.I. from Jersey, Viva Swampy sounds like a very good post-rock band. Majority Report Wardrobe uh, Coordinator. Any of these APAC DMFI primaries succeed, you can kiss 2024 goodbye. Well, I, I, I don't know. I don't, I don't necessarily agree with that, but I do think that it's a problem for uh, progressive politics if it does. If they don't, if they fail, that's very encouraging um, insofar as that it it should inhibit their ability to raise money in the future, but one never knows. Uh, Ant and Scalia's ghost, make sure to pour one out for the Burgermeister. <laughs> Texas leftist, the Evangelical Lutheran Christmas Church in Bethlehem has put in an incredible nativity scene with baby Jesus laid in rubble and debris rather than a manger. Every time I think about it, I start to cry. Wow. Yeah, I mean, that's good. It's Have you seen that? No, but I, I saw someone say, like, it's very difficult to get into the Christmas cheer as the Holy Land is being pumped. <laughs> and that's fair enough. Like, not that, you know, we need to to, to, to make the like, Christmas cheer the prominent, you know, thing we need to be engendering. Or it whatever. is something that I've, I've often thought, like, if I was still very, if I was still, I mean, I was never super Catholic, but if instead of becoming an atheist in my teenage years, I became a Catholic, I, I, it's strange to me to like be like oh yeah everything that's going on in the holy land is fine like we just need to support israel and that's like can we maybe get some peace <laughs> in those places that i hear about in the bible yeah. it is uh it makes me very sus sus suspicious about some of the uh the edicts of uh the religiously pious yeah um although we should say like in terms of like the pope has been calling for a ceasefire and things like that there's some consistency from some religious leaders but definitely not evangelical christian leaders in the united states who are supposedly much more uh accepting of jews according to dennis prager then oh, yeah. yeah not <laughs> european not like christians european and I said, yeah. not christians here are free from that uh yeah blight right i mean uh more often than not when you see horrendous things being said about palestinians uh dehumanizing things it is from a, a fundamentalist jew uh I, I should say in terms of jews um Vivek rhymes with, oh, for Christ's sake, says Ryan and Callie. You know who is anti-Semitic if you aren't the right kind of Jew? Bibi Netanyahu. Oh, yeah. I mean, if you're the wrong shade. Well, also in terms of how you practice on That's some it. level, too. Yeah, yeah. Uh, the Left Reckoning fan. Please do cover the hypocrisy and stupidity showcased by the right wing in the hearing featured, featuring Harvard and MIT heads. What a way to misquote them and call them anti-Semitic. Speech is not violence. Conduct is. Oh, wait. That was the subject of the, uh, you know, Dave Portnoy op-ed on BarstoolSports.com that's getting a lot of attention. I don't even know what you're talking about. The Elise Stefanik did some questioning of uh, basically college administrators about their, camp their campus policies surrounding anti-Semitism. And, um, you know, the, the, the headline is that, I don't want to butcher it actually, but something to the effect of that they refuse to condemn, like, the... Uh, the the calls for genocide calls which for is genocide. from the river to the sea and intifada yeah so right it's conflation of all that stuff